1790, and around the time, there is this very famous economist called Malthus, who made a very interesting observation. That the population of the world will stabilize at around 1.2 billion dollar, uh, people. And the reason is, there will be no more ability to grow food for more people than that. Today we are about 6 billion people in this world. The average age or the lifespan of a person when Malthus made this prediction was about 30. Today it's about 70. In every sense of the word that you can think about, whether it's infant mortality, how we live, how long we live, in every way you can think of, we are better off than what we were 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, they were better off than it was 50 years ago. And before that, they were better off than 50 years ago. What proved Malthus wrong? And what is it that has made us live better, happier, and nicer than continuously? The answer is only one. It's science. It's the human curiosity and the ability to discover and invent new things that's made us live longer, better, happier, and it's going to continue. But then who were these people who were doing this? And, and, and these people are called scientists, and what did they do, and how do they do this? Often I have people coming in, uh, especially children, and I ask them, uh, who were scientists? What do you know about them? And depending on the age, you get a number of different answers. If you ask a teenager, their information about a scientist comes from Big Bang Theory, or, uh, you know... Uh, and if you ask a little kid, they often have seen these pictures of these completely crazy nerds who go into their little hole and come up with these crazy ideas who are unfriendly. Uh, I mean, these are all interesting myths and ideas. What I hope I can do today is to tell you a few stories about scientists and what they do. I wish I was as articulate as Arzu was and use all the verbs about creativity, imagination, connectivity, everything that she said about an artist. The truth is, all of them are true about scientists as well. <laughs> right. So, let me tell you a few stories, and then I'll tell you what it means, but everything is not fun too, okay? So, my first story is about looking at our tradition. So, it started because of uh, a couple of very smart people whom I work with, one is a person called Professor Saudamani, another is a person called Malali Gavra. So, the story is that of Tulasi. I'm sure many of you have seen this idea of having a Tulasi uh, plant, and in olden days, people always offering it to God before it was served to you. So they will take a pot of rice, uh, and hot, when it's just hot, it's cooked, they put a big dollop of ghee in it, and then they will put the green color Tulasi. So it's called the Rama Tulasi. And then there is another Tulasi called the Krishna Tulasi, which is the purple color, which is often used to uh, pray to God like a flower, and it's never eaten. So what, 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 what is this? Is there, is there any reason to do this? Uh, what happens and why do you do this? And this is ancient wisdom. People did this. Is there a scientific basis for doing this? And one could ask this question in multiple ways, and these two people, along with a group of other young students and postdocs, decide to figure out what this means. So what do they do? Technology has developed tremendously that today, you always hear about sequencing the human genome. Well, you can sequence any genome, and they went about sequencing the genome of the humble Tulsi plant. And then they said, okay, now I know the genome of the Tulsi plant, what can I learn from it? They did something very interesting. They said, what are the things that are present in a Tulasi. They found that there are interesting types of molecules that are present. We will ignore the names, ursalic acid, eugenol, it doesn't matter what they are called. And there are hundreds and thousands of papers which go around saying why these are anti-cancer, why these are antioxidants, they're antifungal, all of these. Then they asked the question, how come only the green Tulasi is used, it's not the purple Tulasi? So they did an interesting technique called transcriptome sequencing to find out which one of these tulasis has all of these molecules? And it turns out, the green tulasi has much larger of all of these molecules than the purple tulasi. And it's more interesting. Why is it that it is served the way it was served? The reason it was served the way it was served is, all, is important because 
Many of these are fat soluble compounds. So if you put it in, when you put in hot rice, your pores open up, they dissolve in the ghee that is present, and then you get enough quantities of them. When you eat them with the rice, it gets absorbed better. Here's an interesting idea of something that happened that we could, was present in ancient wisdom, that we could use very high-tech modern science to figure out why we did what we did. There are many more things like that that one can do which you don't know the answers for. Let's fast forward. There's a problem. If all of us decide this is fantastic, we will have large fields of tulsi and no place for rice. <laughs> so what do we, how do we solve this problem? So there is a new area called synthetic biology. What we can do today is take the genes in the tulsi plant, right, that makes all of these compounds, and put them in something like yeast, maybe that one that makes bread for those kids around here, or for the adults, the one that makes beer, put it in this yeast, and then make some beer out of it, which will make all of these compounds, and make some bread with all of these compounds. We can do this without actually worrying about replacing all of our rice and paddy fields and wheat fields with tulsi. So science has taken us from ancient wisdom of understanding how you can use this to being able to find new ways for benefiting from it. I mean, this is my story number one. Okay. People expect that when I give a talk, I have to talk about the cockroach. What is the first thing that you do when you see a cockroach? You stamp it and you kill it. But here is a small problem with the cockroach. It's been around through ice ages lived longer than all of us have, and it's going to outlive all of us. Okay? This humble cockroach is very interesting, and the cockroach that you're seeing on the top is called the Pacific beetle cockroach. And why is this cockroach very interesting? This cockroach is very interesting because we all think of cockroaches as uh, species that will lay an egg. But this is an interesting cockroach. This has something called a birth sac. Okay, and you, you, I'm just saying this before dinner, but there's one more speaker, so you'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, this cockroach lays eggs. And then in the birth sac, as the embryo grows, it makes milk, feeds the babies, and the babies then come out of the, uh, uh, these birth sacs fully mature and ready to mate. They're going to be there for a very, very long time. We heard talks about history. One of the best ways for us to preserve history would be to take all of these stories and history we want to preserve, make them into genetic code, put them into the genome of the cockroach, and hopefully the future generations will figure out to decode our history. Right? So there are wonderful things that one can do. But often, the enemy of science are also scientists themselves. So we did this work, we found out about this, and. You know, it was there in every newspaper, every t TV channel as to how we have found the most nutritious thing. But what did the other scientists think about it when we sent to publish it? And that was a very interesting... Oops, I... Okay, here. So first, they read the paper that we sent for publication and say, on the plus side. And you know that as soon as a paragraph or a comment comes back to you saying, on the plus side, there has to be another one which says on the minus side. So the plus side is in small letters, we can ignore them. So on the minus side, and this is the corruption that has happened among us. I'll tell you why that corruption has changed. He says on the minus side, these results have zero scientific impact beyond reporting on a most unusual biological phenomena. Right? Not even for a specializing community, yes, there is none that exists for it. None of us are interested in the cockroach. That the first thing is. And then they become very patronizing. It says, it's hard to understand how the quite impressive effort extended to pursue these studies was justified. Why did I put this up? Put this up because the whole story of looking at this cockroach and trying to understand how these cockroaches uh, make this milk and all these beautiful crystals appear came out of curiosity of a bunch of young students who worked in my lab. Now, the person saying, He's a scientist telling us, no, 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 no curiosity. You go and cure cancer. So we have fundamentally changed the paradigm which need to reshift if you're actually going to make further scientific progress. And the, of course, he's patronizing and says, 
Hopefully in the near future, these very capable scientists will find more relevant studies to pursue. So we will leave it at that. I'll tell you a third story. You know, scientists are very creative and we really need to be creative in many ways. And here is a slide that I love. It says, as I hurtled through space, one thought kept crossing my mind. Every part of this rocket was supplied by the lowest bidder. So, John Glenn. So, if you come to our institute and I want to order anything, if I want to order an equipment, I need to go with the lowest bidder. And now, I have to be creative enough to do outstanding science with this. You know, India has the ambition of uh, sending people to Mars. So, there is an interesting little uh, uh, small startup called Team Indus. They're trying to send a lander to moon. Now, they said, hey, let's send a lander to moon. What are we going to do on the moon? And, and we were a bunch of people in my institute. We got very excited about this idea and said, we want to do something on the moon. Right? So, what can we do on the moon? And we are a stem cell institute. So you, you remember the previous slide, I would do something about stem cells, right? If I go now and do something else, I may not get money for it. So we said, okay, we'll do something with stem cells. So there's a colleague of mine called Das who works on a little worm. And the worm is called planaria. Okay? And these planarians are very nice little worms. And the nice thing is you can chop them into pieces. And as you chop them into pieces, each piece will become a full worm. Here are a bunch of chopped set of worms that you're seeing. They've been chopped into places. Some of them have eyes, some of them have only tails. Now, if you go close by and look at a tail and see the tail is slowly growing ahead and it becomes a full worm and they are back in action again. Now, what can we do with this worm? Can we send these moons to, uh, worms to the moon on a moon lander? But we have constraints. All we get is a, a Coca-Cola sized box inside which we have to send this moon and we have to cut them and use them. So here is the device that Team Indus has come up with along with us. And if you look at the bottom of the device, the thing that falls down, the worms are going to be down. That's going to come down and cut these worms. And then as they will go up, and there are little, two little tubes there. In one of the tubes of food, you puncture the tube with a laser. The food falls down, and hopefully once these worms become full worms, we can may see them go towards the uh, food. Why is this important? One of the things that people have when they come back from space for a long time is muscle atrophy. And if we can understand how muscle can, if muscle can regenerate well in space, then maybe we can figure out a mechanism to fix it. And if the worm can move, it means it has developed this muscle very well. So there is a lot of imagination, a lot of creativity involved in actually first thinking about an experiment, making a device that we can use it with, and our hope with this device, if it works, is to give it to a lot of schools and have the kids connect these, go around picking worms and cut them and send us pictures through their cell phones of their biology teacher to us, and we can find if we can find new types of planaria. So we can do all kinds of fun things like this. I want to leave with one message that is better articulated by somebody else called Harini Bharat, in the Linda Noble side, which says, she says, how likely is that someone setting out to make an energy food supplement will go looking at a cockroach gut? You can't say science has to be directed. Science has to be creative. It has to come from an individual's curiosity. And this is a great fun time to be a scientist. And why do I say that? We have amazing technologies available, the coming of artificial intelligence, the robotics, all these is made an exciting time where there is a convergence of all of the different sciences, the physics, the chemistry, the engineering, the math, are all coming together to create new things. But we have cultural challenges as well. The challenge that we're going to have is we are all used to being specialists and super specialists. How are we going to now think from not being a super specialist and say, I've got to work with the whole group of people in order to accomplish anything that I had to accomplish hereafter? Can we go through this cultural change? How are we going to educate our next generations and not teach them physics, chemistry, or biology, but all of them together? If we can get through all of these challenges, I think it'll be fantastic. And more interestingly, about half the people in this audience are going to live for 100 years. The other half is going to live 125. Okay? Now, if you're going to do this, there has to be a point in living. So this is where arts, 
And all of this come about. And Arsu talked about augmented reality. It is science that has brought virtual reality and augmented reality to art. And I'm hoping there will be more artists and people who give us a reason to live 150 years. Thank you very much.